I think it probably makes sense to get started. So I think that this is probably going to be a pretty short, um, a pretty short, uh, you know, demo describing what app application mode is and what it does. Um, but uh, yeah, so what I have here is uh, Deep Haven running. Is is the screen size fine here? The font size. Yes. It looks great. Yeah, everything everything was good. All right, excellent. So uh, this is Deep Haven running on a box that I have, um, and I have app app mode setting app mode running on it. So in particular. Have a little script here that basically points um, dpaven to application.dir to uh, this directory here, and in this directory I have um, two applications defined, and they're both getting loaded and they're being loaded in alphabetical order, which is why this is uh, zero zero. Um, this first one basically I'm using as a way of kind of initializing my um, my. Um, you know, my deep haven experience. I'm going to import whatever I want to import that's, you know, that's important to me. I'm going to create any variables in the query scope that are important to me. Um, but this is basically like, you know, going to be my, um, you know, my development script. Okay. So uh, for this particular app, I'm So, already so, so are, are both of these running on the same server and this is like a run level in Linux or is this something else here? Yeah, it's kind of like that. Yeah, they're both running in the same server, and it's ordered alphabet. They get loaded in alphabetical order. Okay. Um, yeah, so this one's a, a Groovy script. Uh, so you guys specify the script type. Um, the script type has to map, match the server type, so I can't run both Python and Groovy scripts on the same server at this time. Um, I give it an, an ID. This is helpful in case you create a layout. The layout uses this ID instead of uh, the name um, for you know maintaining uh, and rebuilding. Um, so that in case your your application changes, uh, the I, if the ID is the same, then it's totally fine. But maybe your human displayable name changed. Um, and then basically at the at the very end, I've got just a single file. Uh, you can see it's file underscore zero, and then this is is numeric. I could have zero, ten, and a thousand, and they get loaded in numerical order. Um, and it's pointing at this other uh, at this other script. So this script is one that I can see actually from within the IDE, and it's very simple right now, just to kind of like demo the idea. Um, but basically, I've got an import for table tools, and I just create a simple empty table e which um, is part of my layout, my default layout. So let's see, I should be able to use table tools. Actually, I should have tried this. I was planning on trying this beforehand, but did not um, see if it works. So I have a file that I downloaded from the internet. Um, search. Called music sales at CSV. Uh, I don't know what it is. I also don't know this method apparently. Looks like it takes a file. It's read CSV, not not Pythonic. Okay, so you can see I can I can load that table. Everything it looks like garbage, but <laughs> I guess that's a public data set for you. Um, but I can take this now and I can shove this into um, my uh, into my startup script if this is a table that I might find interesting, and then I can restart my deep haven. Um, the UI detects immediately that I'm restarting the back end. And it'll be up soon, but once it's up, I will be able to find that new table um, in the panel directory over here. So uh, there, I've got, I've got the table right there. And if I wanted to make this part of my default layout, uh, I can export the layout, and I get 
file here. Um, I'll just call it that. And then okay. And then if I load this up in an incognito window, um, it should automatically have M loaded there in my uh, in my layout now, which you can see. Um, so it's quite easy to change, you know, to make a default layout. Uh, I thought that there was a way that I could list the layouts that were available to me, but I couldn't figure out where that was. Um, but I thought that we had a way of, you know, if you had multiple layouts in the directory, that you would uh, be able to see them. Um, okay, so for the other app, um, Basically, it is a it's a dynamic app which loads a Java class um, that I created over here. Um, so it's a very simple application. Uh, actually, let me show you the the Gradle file. So the Gradle basically file says, "Oh, I also need an additional dependency, which is going to be Java WebSocket," and um, and then the application uh, simply implements this factory. So it uh, it's just one method, this create method that matters. And inside of here, I create a new application state. Um, so this is where it's getting its ID from, where it's getting its name. So almost all of the configuration is hoisted into your uh, Java application here. Um, and then I create a WebSocket client pointed at um, just some crypto uh, data feed. And, uh, and then on open, I'll print out that it's open, and I'll request basically uh, BTC USD from them, and then every time I get a message from them, I'll print it out, uh, and then I'll you know message on close and message on air. Um, you know the way that that's working isn't the interesting part. The interesting part is that you can use it as a building block. Um, so here in my application state, you can see I set a custom field, which is uh, this WebSocket client. And I actually pass in this object here entirely. So I'm actually not even starting the WebSocket client in my application. Normally, you probably would, but for the demo, I'm actually I didn't want it to be spitting it out, uh, spitting out content all the time um, before I even got there. Plus, it shows off uh, kind of a feature uh, when you're working in app mode with the REPL available. Um, and then I also inject this app into the query scope. Um, as as the name app, that way I can use it. So you can kind of get the same kind of. If you wanted to leak variables into the query scope, uh, leak is probably not a very good word, um, but I like the word leak for whatever reason. Um, but I understand it has negative connotation. But if I wanted to expose uh, this, you know, this parameter in the query scope, I can do that right here, just like in a script application. Um, and then I would, okay. so yes, go ahead. quick question. Mm -hmm. um, when you expose a variable to the query scope, does that mean you can use it within like a query string as a variable? Exactly. You can okay. use it as a query string, and you can also use it um, from within the REPL. So I was actually, oh, I'll show you that now. So the one that I stuck into the query scope directly is called app. So in fact, I have a little thing here. So. I can basically, I'm just you know printing out app, which is the thing that was stuffed into the query scope. So here's my application state. And then I'm printing out the ID here. Um, and you'll remember that I had that other field, uh, WSC. Um, it is not bound to the query scope. So it doesn't actually exist here. Um, but uh, an interesting thing here is that from the panel's uh, window, it's very clear that WSC is a, a widget that is um, or it's it's technically a custom object, but it's a custom object that is exposed by the uh, by the client. You can't do anything with that in the UI at this time. Um, but since I have the application state in the query scope, I can actually reference uh, that field that's in there and extract the current value from it. Um, it's this API isn't smart enough to know what the type is, so I also have to cast it. Um, but I'm going to cast it to that WebSocket client and start it up. Nice. All right, that's super cool. Oops, I, I need to actually do the import first. There we go. 
Right. So now it's open, and you can see it's spitting out uh, stuff into the console. Now, normally, like the the more interesting thing is this actually is getting shoved into a table, right? And the table's ticking, and uh, and everything is you know is that easy to quote unquote get you know a live data feed for your uh, for a symbol that you wanted. Um, and similarly, I can just close it. Um, let's see. Another relevant thing is that you can uh, disable the REPL. And I've actually not seen how the layout looks. I don't know if it automatically removes the layout or changes the layout. Let's see. So it should be dash D, B Python, console dot disable, I think. Yeah. Let's see if that works. No, I'll look it up. It does seem to be running, but it doesn't. No, okay. I don't know why <clears throat> it won't <laughs> won't let me connect at all. Um, but yeah, so that's that's pretty much the that's the main point of the uh, of the presentation is to show off application mode. Um, any questions? So, Nate, do you have all these in, in uh, blog posts? Uh, there, this is actually in. There's some documentation. It's a how-to guide, and Amanda wrote it up, actually. Okay. It doesn't go into the dynamic part, though. That is super. Cool. Yeah. Well, it's just as easy. I think the dynamic stuff is just as easy. Uh, and also, there's there's like a difference between static and dynamic here. Um, the dynamic aspect implies that the program can add new fields during the runtime of the application. So it might add new fields, it might remove new fields, or remove fields. Um, it can literally do anything that it wants, uh, but if you wanted to guarantee up front that none of the fields are changing, you can use this, this static pattern. And the static pattern just, uh, it creates the state, that application state for you, so you can't stick it into the query scope, and um, it becomes a little bit less flexible in that context. Um, but yeah, it was intended to be configurable as easily configurable as a script, um, a script application, but uh, you know through Java or the JVM. So it could be technically Scala, it could be Kotlin, it could be Groovy. Um, it doesn't matter. Right. Um, yeah. Any other questions here? So, uh, you know, you, you you have the thing here where you're running two applications. Uh huh. Um, do they share a variable space, or are they separate, or? What's yes, they, they share everything. They they share the query scope. They share the compiler context. Absolutely, everything is shared. It's very similar to as if you would have created two tabs and connected to the same host. Okay, so they, it's possible for them to step on each other. 
Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So that's why the ordering, I mean, you can use the word step on each other or you could use the word like empower each other. So uh, the reason that I created that the very first example is my quote unquote common examples is that I expect there are things that I'm going to want, like little utilities that are going to be useful, but don't have like, um, you know, any, they're not associated with any, any idea. They're just like useful utilities. And so I'm going to shove them all in there. And then later on, if I end up creating two different scripts, I might, you know, have find use for another middle layer. If that makes sense. Okay, just from a from an execution perspective, what's happening? Is it executing all of the first script and then all of the second script, or is it it's something else going on? That's exactly what's going on. Okay. In fact, that that also happens if you have two windows open connected to the same backend, and you're on on you know one user in one tab is you know writing his own. You know he's interacting with the with the REPL, and the other user is also interacting with REPL. Neither of them is running simultaneously with each other. They're they're both uh, sitting behind a queue, waiting for their turn for their script to run. Okay, so from a user perspective, um, you know what I, I guess what are the you know what are the ways that this, you know, multiple application thing should or should not be used. Um, you know, I, mean, I think that it should be used in any creative way that you can imagine. So, like using it to initialize your environment, I think, is kind of useful when you've got like short development cycles. Uh, using it to create like a foundation that an entire company uses um, for a bunch of their, you know, data. I think that that seems pretty useful too. In terms of like allocating, let's say you have, you know, three machines and ten queries that you want to run. In terms of being able to move them around very easily, if all it is is a symlink into that directory for which host is loading which queries and then a restart, I think that's kind of like a convenient way of you know getting, you know, moving things around without a lot of. Uh, it's not high touch, right? Okay. Okay. What are, what other questions? So, uh, Amanda, you 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 did the documentation on this. I guess what uh, what what did you learn from that, or or what should we know? You know, I haven't seen it done with the the dynamic. That was pretty cool. I kind of wanted to see that. Um, I would say that the the thing that I learned from this is that it's really easy to use app mode and not put it so that you can actually use it in the REPL. And that stumped me for a little bit because I couldn't didn't have access to the tables because I didn't make them global. Um, I used the, the pure application state and context and then I didn't make the tables global, so they were hidden under the application state. Okay, is that easy to do, to, to make them global? Oh, it's, it's super easy, it's just I didn't do it, and it was like, why is my data not here? <laughs> yeah, so like in a Python application, it's as simple as like labeling the variables for the function call as global, and then they become part of the query scope. So in fact, it, like the only way to encapsulate something in the Python version is inside of a method, right? You have to invoke a method. So that's what she's saying. So like we we think that that's probably the default. You probably don't want every X or E or you know T to leak into the query scope. You probably want only the very specific things that you've built to be leaking. Well, let's say getting published to the query scope. Like intentional publishing. Sure. Okay. All right. And then uh, Jake and JJ, um, since you guys will, I'm sure at some point create one of these. Um, what what's not clear, or what, what do you have questions about? 
Um, I worked with app mode on uh, my Prometheus app, and only the only thing I was able to resolve it. Um, I mean, we, I, that's why I asked the question today. But about like if I wanted to like interact with the tables that I created like in my script in the UI, um, it seems like I just need to set that query scope um, thing. Yeah. Well, there are two there are two ways of doing it. Actually, that's one way to do it. Um, here, let me show you another way real quick. All right. Yeah, and, and in in Python, you wouldn't. Uh, use exactly that query scope. And I guess there's the two ways of doing the app mode when you're doing these. There's the application state and context. And then there's just putting everything in like a normal query. Is there a big advantage with using the application state and context objects? I think so. I think that the benefit is that you end up getting a bucket of things that could be similarly named. Um, Let me show you. Uh, let's see. I think I'll be able to answer that that question the same the same way with the same example. I was thinking you could, yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to steal this other example that I have. Um, and, oops, I forgot to restart. I'll need to figure out why disabling the REPL causes that not to work right. Come on. There we go. All right, so I'm just going to shove this example in here and then immediately restart it. <laughs> okay, so this particular example, uh, it does the you know the Python thing that Amanda was just talking about, or it's like the Python way of taking the application application context, and then initializing with um, a, a lambda that takes an application state. So that you're given the application state, and then you do whatever with it, which is slightly different than the than this earlier example where I'm just kind of modifying the query scope directly. Um, so here, uh, this app has one uh, field called hello and one field called world. And uh, as you were pointing out, is you, 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 know, you can't grab hello from the query scope because it's not in the query scope. Um, but you can, however, uh, go up here to this panels thing and, and select it um, and then modify it from here. I guess you can't add, I guess you can only do UI manipulation. So like sorting, filtering, You can't pull but you can make the, the table board. global beforehand and then have access to it. Right, exactly. This method, I think. Yeah. Right. Like this one, this M I can do. So is making the variable global the preferred way to do it? I think preferred is up to is up to you, depending on what it is that you're doing. <laughs> Sounds good to me. <laughs> okay, so let, let me let me under, make sure I'm understanding this. So, um, if you just do a script, the variables are global, and you can access them either on the command line or in the GUI. And if you go through this other initialization with the application state or whatever it is, then they're just available through the GUI. Yeah, exactly. Uh, or you can, if you have access to the application state, so. Uh, you can get access, you know, the, behind all of these variables are uh, the, you know, the gRPC tickets that represent them. So like um, an API client can take any of those tables and apply any operations to them. So like the fact that I couldn't actually type in to update in the UI to change a table um, that I pulled from the panel, you could do that in a, in a client. 
um, the you know the web client could do this too. Um, but yeah, so like I expect uh, you know one tool that I might write for myself uh, will simply ask all of the servers that I have that run Deephaven what applications are installed and what fields do they have exposed, and then I can just like spit that out and in, in, in as a table. Um, um, so yeah. Does that make sense? That, like you can still refer to them as tables through the API. Right. You, you you can you can get to the variable. You just have to do it two or three steps down the line. Is that right or not? You can actually directly reference. So from the way the way the API works uh, is basically you give it this ticket, and this ticket describes uh, a table and how to find the table. So it could be a query scope. And effectively, it's like you know an S for scope slash, and then the variable name. Um, for an application mode, it's like you know A slash the ID for the application slash the field name, um, and then you can immediately reference these objects through for the API for any API method, whether those are table operations, or um, you know even opening a new console. Uh, or calling custom gRPC methods, you, we we would be able to, you know, refer to these tables or these items. They don't have to be tables, um, which is you know why in that example I'm exposing a WebSocket client so I can actually manipulate it um, as as the as a client. The only other thing that caught me by surprise with it was that the double quotes work inside um, you know, the console, but they do not work inside the scripts that you're running in app mode. So that's another thing to be careful about. That, I think those were smart quotes. I think we talked about that before. I thought you had smart, a smart quote. Oh, is that what it was? I think so. <laughs> I hate because smart I'm quotes. I'm definitely using I double quotes in, this, in the Groovy script that I already ran. Well, sweet. But uh, it's not a Python, I, and it's not. Uh, I'm not prepared to try it in Python right now. Okay. All right, JJ. Do you have any questions? Uh, as far as how it works, um, no. It's pretty cool presentation. As far as um, so, where I guess you know, where does the use of app mode fall within our customer-facing blogs? Examples, demos, you know, documentation. Where, where do we think we want customers to just get some Docker image or package that includes something that's just going to be auto running code the moment they run Deephaven up versus something with you know a guided walkthrough or do this on your own? So it's kind, I, of a, it's kind of a broad question, yeah. but. I think that it kind of would make sense for most of the demos to be packaged up in application mode, where you just download it, you pull it up, and then you know, boom, you've got a layout that kind of walks you through, you know, maybe even the the README uh, work that um, Bender has been doing, and you just it just walks you through the application. Okay. Because yeah, we uh, Bender demoed. It was, you know, it was kind of like a Jupyter notebook where you it would run a code block and then you'd read some stuff and then it'd run you through the next code block. Is it possible to get app mode to work it should, with? Or should work with something like that? I, I think I think that's a great use case of app mode for us. Okay, because that would be pretty cool if it starts off by, you know, the first thing it does is run the first block and then you, you immediately get to read about it. And... Yeah. So, uh, yeah, Nate, how how would that work? Do you would you just have, you know, the notebook as the the prime thing, and you'd save the layout so that pops up first, or exactly? Yeah, it would be part of the layout. So you basically would save the layout where the primary thing is that notebook that's in the rendered mode. Okay. Feng, you had a question. Oh yeah, I mean, what, what's uh, what's the impact of an uh, app mode on you know the clients? For example, my my Python client. Oh, is, is there anything special I need to 
Oh, no, we so already have some gRPC stuff nope. that oh, we can yeah. label oh, it, disable uh, it. Yes, there is a. So if you haven't already know, known, there is um there is a gRPC API for applications, um, and you can extract fields from it, and you can also listen to the fields. So the, if the field changes, you get updates, or if there are new fields. Uh, you get updates. You can also use them, use that to listen to the query scope uh, and the query scope changes, um, which makes you know having multiple browser windows open a little bit friendlier to each other. When one declares, you know things in the REPL, they can now be accessed from the panel drop-down menu. Um, in terms of the client, I don't think it's like a critical thing for the client to be able to do. I think it's certainly helpful. I'm going to use it, uh, you know, even just using the gRPC wrapper around those methods, even if it's not part of the Java client, the proper Java client. Um, but yeah, in terms of like using it, you that's a you know that's at startup, so it's kind of like the you know whoever is launching Dpaven gets to decide what runs, and so the big benefits they have are you know they decide upfront what they want to have started. They don't have to go and run that initial script. Um, to kind of like make that worker do what that worker is supposed to be doing whenever it's running. It could be used in the context of like one-off jobs. Um, you could launch this uh, pointing at an application that exits or terminates when it has completed its work. Um, and then, you know, just simply quote, quote unquote, I air quote simply because it's obviously a very hard problem in DevOps, uh, but, you know, basically, you know, then it's a DevOps problem. Um, for whatever work you want to have done every day and preventing yourself from falling behind every day and, and, and all that mess. But it can be used that way. Okay. Uh, so, you know, I, I guess we kind of have two kinds of queries, the kind that run forever and the kind that finish at some point. Mm -hmm. um, do we have a way to say, Whatever, when the script is done, exit. Oh yes, yeah, system dot exit. Okay, so you close. Dot exit is the way. To exit. I mean, I think that's a fair way to exit. So so, and then it's a dev. And at that point, it's a DevOps problem, right? So, uh, oh, when this thing's when it exits with code, you know, negative ten, I actually need to alert somebody about it. Or you know, when it exits, uh, you know, cleanly. Um, it actually wants to be restarted because it's meant to be running all the time and it decides now's a good time to restart at least once a day. Um, so, you know, you kind of build in what you want to have happen from a DevOps perspective. And uh, I understand that, you know, we're giving the world Docker and a Docker setup, uh, but that is not the only way that we can you know, run, run the application. And I think people who want to run it in a great environment are, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Okay, and so do those, those exit codes are what gets passed through Docker and returned? Uh, I am not sure how the Docker aspect of that works, but I do know if you call system.exit1, then the process, the JVM process, exits with a return code of 1. So it's quite easy to run our stuff without Docker, uh, and so you, know, you, get a, you get a lot more flexibility it, it, okay. Is it possible for the for app to to run in the background and through my through the Python client I can sort of interact with it in certain ways? Uh, yeah. Um, so what what happens when application mode starts up? It actually does not launch the gRPC server until after all of the applications have completed their initial uh, configuration. So if you wanted to have an interactive startup. Uh, you could do that. Uh, it would basically be I mean, not not at not the startup, startup but, but after the startup. Oh yeah. You know, well, so I can just just send the app. The, you know, I assume the app is running in the background. And, yeah. yeah. Uh, I can interact with it. Uh, okay. Absolutely. Yeah. You can even uh, in the example that I gave. It's not obvious how to do it, but it is. It can be done. You can take a jar, like my example, and in addition to having, you know, your your extra application logic, you could add another gRPC service that has additional RPCs that you use to interact with your application. So you're not actually limited to what we're doing. Uh, you can you can extend that. Yeah, I'm 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 thinking more in the line of uh, 
um, so the so the app depends on a table, but from the client I can send data into that table, you know, periodically, and you know, the app will just process it, you know. Exactly. Okay, so so say that again. You said you can extend the gRPC with your own gRPC stuff. Yep. Yeah, you can add your own if you wanted to create. Uh, let's see if I can come up with a quick example. Yeah, suppose that you had um, uh, like you wanted to create an API for risk management, and you wanted to have an application that focused is, focuses on application or sorry risk management. So allocating a, uh, resources to particular kinds of asset classes. Um, you could create a you know gRPC configuration or, or you know set of RPCs that specifically update you know certain kinds of things or whatever that is exactly what you want and then you can expose an object that is a table that has you know that gives you the result the, like the current state of, of the of the risk management you know how far how deep you are in certain asset classes how close you are to the limits um, and so on. Okay, and so how how mechanically how does that get hooked in? Yeah, so, um, you know, so, so, so like an example I'm thinking of is uh, at a client, they're fitting uh, option model stuff. And, you know, at some point they may want to some, they may have some other application and having an interface to say, send me the option model state for Apple is you know, a, a reasonable use case for them. Yeah. So the plan is to use the, I think it's called config loader um, to load in additional gRPC services. And then your application would be in addition to that. So maybe your application is then just pulling the, you know, it's global instance off of the gRPC service that you, you know, that was bound from the service loader. Okay. So you, you would, do whatever auto generation and stuff to create the services, then you would set up the config this lo loader and then that would pick up the stuff. And that would pick it up and it would bind it. Yeah. So that that hook is not yet implemented, but that is as a service loader is the intended path. Um, and you know the first time that we have a use case for it, I'd be happy to, you know, to put it together. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be a good example.